pick up your phone or jump on the internet. You direct the show with your questions. You may ask anything tonight on Call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. Dr. Holm is away tonight. I am Dr. Andrew Ellsworth of the Avera Medical Group at Brookings in Brookings, South Dakota. We'll start taking your questions in a moment. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. Continuity of care, when patients use their primary source of care for most of their health care needs, results in A, more satisfied patients, B, patients following through with their doctor's recommendations, C, lower hospitalization rates, D, decreased use of the emergency room, or E, all of the above. Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of Dr. Holmes' essays, originally written for this show, comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We will announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in. We answer your medical questions about pretty much anything as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight are Dr. Aaron Shives and Dr. Dan Riefenberger, both from the Brown Clinic in Watertown, South Dakota. Thank you both for coming tonight. Aaron, tell me a little bit about yourself and your practice. Grew up in Millbank, uh, went to SDSU, got to go to USD, and then went through residency in Sioux Falls at the Family Medicine Residency. Been in Watertown at the Brown Clinic for getting close to 30 years. And your family? We've got uh, four kids, my wife Deanna and I, and all are married, and about nine plus grandkids. Wow, all right. How about you, Dan? Well, I graduated from USD in uh, med school in 91, and then my wife and I were in the same class, that's where we met, and then went through the Sioux Falls Family Medicine Residency and, and graduated in 94, and then moved to Watertown. Originally was from Watertown, but grew up in Sioux Falls. We've been practicing there ever since. Um, we have three kids, twin daughters that will be 24, and then my son is 21. All right. And I guess since I'm a, uh, not a regular host, uh, I'm uh, originally from Madison, uh, South Dakota. Went to Augustana for undergrad and USD for medical school and residency in Boise, Idaho. And now I've been in Brookings for six years. We already have a question. When is the best time to get a flu shot? Is it too early now? Should I wait till October? What do you think, Aaron? Well, you, if you go to hy or Walgreens, they've got it right now, but you don't have to be in a rush. I don't know if there's even any cases in the United States that I've heard about. About every Friday, the Department of Health puts out information about the number of flu cases, and there's just nothing out there yet. So can I get it now and be protected through the spring? Absolutely. Do I wait, am I okay because my employer is going to give it in two, three, four weeks, yeah, you should be fine. It takes about two weeks for it to kick in and work. Do you think there's any weaning immunity where if you get it too early, it's not going to work later? No. Okay, good. Um, now, there's some other shots, too, that have been kind of newer that I've been hearing about. What, uh, is, there's that new shingle shot. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Dan? I mean, it, it's uh, called Shingrit. Shingrix, and it comes in a series of two, one at the time you started and one two to six months later. Um, the benefit of this one versus the original one that had come out years ago, Zostavax, that was a one-time shot. The, the uh, efficacy or actual efficiency, I'd say, benefit was about 50% on that Zostavax and the Shingrix is about 90%, so much more effective. So I've been encouraging patients to, to consider it. The only problem with it is came out toward the end of January when it was available, but they've run out. There's a shortage of it, so you can't even get it. So we keep getting different updates with it, telling us by the end of the year they may have enough with it, but that's the problem right now. You just can't get it because of availability. Do you think 
it matters if you've had the old shot or not, if you should have the new one? No, you should still, we still will encourage the, the newer one just because of that 90% uh, efficacy part on it. Much more effective as far as protection against shingles. Now some people have had the rash and it wasn't so bad and it usually goes away after, you know, maybe a month or less yeah. or so. So maybe, I mean, what, why get it, you think? Because um, you can get shingles more than once to begin with. can be in different locations as far as with it. If anybody's ever had it um, and you've experienced the pain with it, most of them can't wait to get in to get it because they're not going to tolerate that again. So it doesn't matter if you've had shingles before, you can get it again. Yeah. Cost is roughly, they tell me, $200. It's, the nice thing about this one, it's a dead virus, whereas the Zostavax was a live virus and you had to watch if you're pregnant <coughs> or around somebody with chemotherapy, but this is a dead virus. But $200, you've got to see if Medicare Part D covers it or your insurance. You know, and I'd add that, you know, sometimes you get shingles and it doesn't go away. You know, the rash might go away, but the pain right. sometimes lasts. I right. just saw one today yeah. that he's had it four months ago and he still had the rash and the pain. So there's kind of the reason for me to right. let's try to prevent it so it doesn't become a lifelong right. suffer. Because it can really be debilitating. Yeah. So remember, this is your show. We need your questions. You, you decide what we're going to talk about. Um, you know, it's fall. It's football season. Yeah. Dan, any, any thoughts on this concussion thing? Cause yeah. I mean, and concussion has really been taken a center stage on things just because of the consequences that can come with it long term with it. So um, I think we're getting to the point, especially in, uh, in football and carrying over into other sports with it, but especially football, the seriousness of it. So um, if there's any question of any athlete having one, they're, first they're out of the game. They go through a series of uh, or protocol with it of evaluation. We have what's called an impact test that can be used as a tool to end up helping us decide when that athlete may be safe enough and recovered enough to go back to play. So my big thing with it is uh, encourage everyone and, and their teammates if they if they even see anything or suspect anything with one of their their teammates or the coaches to tell us because it really is a big deal. We want to be looking out for their future, not just for the next week's game. Yeah, it's just not worth it. Not worth it. From what we've learned. Right. In the end, healthcare comes down to the relationship between the patient and the provider. When we were growing up, medicine meant our family doctor. When we were sick, had a broken bone, or got hurt, that's where we went. The technology was simpler then, but our doctors took care of us and helped us stay healthy. Things changed over time. We changed, and healthcare started to change too. Scientific advancements made medicines and treatment better, but the healthcare system got more complicated. We started spending a lot more money, but all that investment didn't make people healthier. Healthcare started to feel a little disjointed and impersonal. Now everybody is talking about reform and the system. It's gotten pretty loud, but nobody's really talking about health, good health. Isn't that really what we all want? Our country has the best doctors, the best hospitals, and the most innovative scientists. Shouldn't we be healthy? Somewhere we lost our way. We forgot what matters. We need to embrace the values that make people healthy, like a long-term relationship with a trusted doctor, someone who knows us, our family, and our risk factors, someone we can connect with when we need them, who uses the latest technology, someone who can help us stay healthy, and when we're sick, help us get the most from the healthcare system, someone who can see the big picture and the small one, that's what the best healthcare should be, a system based on primary care that can make our advanced medical system work for real people. We know how to get there, and going there now can give us a system that works for everyone and makes us healthy again. Now is the time. Together, let's make America a place where health is primary. And that's what it comes down to, right? I mean, that's why we went into medicine was to be there for the patient. Um, as family doctors, as in, in family medicine, wh what does that mean? We're all family medicine doctors here. What does that mean? Well, I would like to hope that it means I'm an integral part of their life. We're taking care of anything that comes up, 
dealing with any situation that may come up with them. Um, they're looking to us for guidance, trust. Um, that's what makes family medicine so much fun because like I say, we are so much of an integral part of that and uh, very close knit, um, you know, taking care of them from birth until they die. And when we lose a patient, we, it's like losing part of your family too. We get to see the whole picture. The whole picture. Yeah. Gonna help coordinate, integrate, hold their hand whenever needed. Like I said, it's just so, so much variety as far as with it and that's what makes every day so interesting because no two days are the same. How many families do you take care of that you take care of the kids, the parents, and the grandparents? Lots. Too many to count. <laughs> Too many to count. And, and that makes it so much nicer. Dan brings it up. It's just, I mean, you're taking care of the grandparents. So you know what's going on over here with grandma who's got Alzheimer's. And now the family's dealing with it. Or this one's got breast cancer and how they're dealing with it. So you have a unique perspective. You can help with all that. Yeah. Excellent. This is your show. Your questions are key to our show discussions. <laughs> Call in your questions to one 888 376 6225 or send us an email to ask at the prairie.org. Well, let's see, we do have some questions here. A man from Rapid City asks, my dad suffers from fibromyalgia and over the course of his life was prescribed so many pills he was taking 34 pills at one time. Later in his life he started losing his sanity. I, his son, also have fibromyalgia but am only on five pills. I want to know what my chances are of losing my sanity. Was it the disease that led to his mental decline or was it the high number of medicines he was taking over his lifetime? Oh, well, yes, good question. Um, probably not the medications. Probably had nothing to do with the fibromyalgia at all. Um, probably had some type of dementia and that can run in the family. It's one of the things that can. Not very high as compared to like colon cancer, but. Um, there are lots of treatments for fibromyalgia. Number one treatment for fibromyalgia, as you know, physical therapy. Mm -hmm. And get them yeah. moving and get them active outside. Yeah. Uh, we used to treat people that was what, because they didn't know, there's no actual test for fibromyalgia, but if you get them active, uh, it, they will do better. They just can't do overdo it, that's it. What do you think about being on 34 pills? I don't think a lot of it. Uh, my preference would be none. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, if, you, if they're on so many different things as far as with it, then you're not handling it correctly. You're, you're, uh, there are certain antidepressants that can end up helping as far as from the chronic pain aspect of it, but pain medications do not have a role in anything with the fibromyalgia. You're, you're right on the activity. Exercise is still one of the main treatments for it, and I'm a big, big pusher on exercise as far as with it. They're in control of their own. Um, and right, you can't overdo it. There's a fine line between enough and not enough. But by far and away is the main treatment versus anything of any pills. Yeah, I'd say go, you know, if you're on that many pills, go see your doctor and say, what right. can we get rid of? Right. A woman from Yankton asks, what is the treatment of lupus and what are the complications of it? Well, this is this is <laughs> this is gonna be one of those. Yeah, yeah, this is one as far as with yeah. it where I I'm really gonna re rely on our uh, rheumatologist colleagues with it. I mean, we help ma help manage certain of the things that come in. Lupus is a very very uh, specific disease with multiple different complications yeah. as far as with it, and by no means. Am I, am I able to keep up on what the latest is on that? So I would have to defer that to the rheumatologist. That was one in medical school where the answer was always lupus as yeah. an option. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. A woman from Sioux Falls wonders what causes dry mouth, especially in the morning after you wake up? There can be multiple causes for that. And the first question I had, do you snore? because keeping your mouth open and oh no I don't, I don't snore. It's like well how do you know you don't snore? Because that'd be one thing. Um, certain not taking enough fluids might be another. Your medications you're on might be another thing. So go talk to your doctor. And then there's other things that could be diseases. So talk to your doctor about it because they need more of a history. 
A woman from Harrisburg wants beta blockers and blood thinner explained. Hmm. How do beta blockers work, Dan? Beta blockers are, are, can have multiple reasons or benefits. They can lower your blood pressure, they can lower your heart rate, but they also help increase the strength of the contraction of that heart muscle. So, in, and if we're talking beta blockers and blood thinners, I'm, I'm kind of getting a drift that she has some degree of heart disease with it, and that's probably why she's on the blood thinners with it too, to end up helping to promote that blood flow through those vessels. But the, the beta blocker in that point is helping to improve the oxygenation and the contraction ability of the heart. You know, it gives the heart, if it slows down a little bit, it gives the heart a little bit more time to fill up again right. so it can have uh, right. more effective, you know, or if it's, you know, if it's going really fast, atrial fibrillation, right. then, it, then it's not going to fill up. Right. And, and, uh, and, of course, the, the blood thinners can help prevent right. strokes and, and everything. A 72-year-old female who had influenza A last January, would she be more susceptible to the flu this year? Which flu this year? That's the question because yeah. the influenza mutates so frequently and it's multiple different, is it A or B, you know, so might be a little bit more immune, but just because she's, what, 70-some did you say? 72. 72. Her immune system is not as good as if she was 26 or so. So it helps a little bit, but still needing the flu vaccine right. this year to try and cover. And everybody has to realize this is just the most common ones from last year. And so yeah. just because it might have mutated in the meantime in the last nine months, we don't know. And that's why we get flu shots every year because the strains change. So you're still vulnerable as far as with it each year. Yeah, I saw a study that showed that the people that got a flu shot every year had a lot more protection in a given year than the person who just got the flu shot that year because maybe this year's didn't match up right to this season, but that maybe covered them, gave them some protection for next year or the year after. So it really can help, even if it's one of those years where they didn't match it up very well. It's cumulative from year to year. Right. And, so. and too, depending on the strain as far as with it, even um, if somebody's had the flu vaccine, they can still get influenza. Yeah. Um, I will say kind of in general, um, some of those ones, or at least most of the ones that ended up getting influenza and had the flu shot, they at least tended to not be as sick as the right. ones who didn't have the yeah. influenza vaccine. Yeah. And influenza still kills. I think the number was like 65 last year in the state of South Dakota that died from influenza. So it's just like, well, it's everybody else. And there was a spectrum. Yes, it was usually the elderly, but there was also younger yeah. people that got it. So, And then there's the people that can't get the shots so or are helping to protect mm -hmm. them with the herd immunity, you know, saying that if, if 8 out of 10 people are vaccinated, it won't circulate around so the other two don't get it, you know, so... Um, a grandson diagnosed with a bone cyst on the femur. My brother has one in his ankle. What causes bone cysts? Is it hereditary? How do you treat it? Yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm not aware of anything hereditary part with it. Um, if it truly is a cyst and it has, doesn't have anything in the appearance of a cancer or malignancy, Okay, I think it depends more on the location and the size of it. How much of that bone is involved with weight bearing and how much it can give to support of that, that bone. But again, if we find anything as far as with it from there, we're gonna have the help of the orthopedic doc on there because they're the ones that would have to manage to decide, do we just continue to watch this or are we gonna have to do something invasive yeah. to take care of it? Yeah, they might just watch it. Watch it and like, the, yeah. the size of it definitely has a factor. Here's one from Facebook uh, with, a, with a CPAP, you know, the continuous positive air pressure for sleep apnea. She had just diagnosed, have you heard of cutting the uvula to open the airway? So I think they're talking about maybe, you know, alternative treatment yeah. option. Yeah. And you can have the uvulectomy that's called where you remove the uvula. Uh, the one thing in the back of the The throat. thing, yeah. that hangy down thing in the back, right. Um, the patients that have had it, I've been told it's one of the most painful procedures out there. Mm -hmm. That's just what they've mentioned. But there are people that use mouthpieces for sleep apnea. It depends on how, what the degree of the sleep apnea. Otherwise, CPAP by itself, some people use BiPAP. It's a little bit different. So there's multiple different 
things that you can use. You can have skinny people with CPAP. It doesn't have to be the big heavy set mm -hmm. person with the size 18 neck. It doesn't yeah. have to be. It's, you know, it's amazing more and more how we're finding sleep apnea and getting it treated and how it can decrease, getting treated can decrease your risk of heart attack and stroke and dementia and so your and help your energy level to go up so that way you're more active so you're healthier which your blood pressure goes down and it just kind of and and or when someone all of a sudden is you know atrial fibrillation you feel like it came out of nowhere well it turns out they had sleep apnea that wasn't controlled. And we're diagnosing it a lot more now just because of the awareness of it. Yeah. Didn't, didn't have the knowledge of that part beforehand and I have multiple patients who have had the the uvulectomy and they're still on a CPAP right. machine. So the majority of the times that used to always be more the mainstay of the treatment with it, now hardly anybody has a uvulectomy anymore. It'd be nice if there was a quick fix or a surgery, right. but a lot of times that doesn't do Correct. it. Correct. Um, are wound nurses effective for all wounds? Well, they're certainly helpful, aren't Very. they? You yeah. guys have them down in Philippines? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, you know, of course, as with anything, uh, the experience could matter, or their training, I should say, yeah. matters. Mm -hmm. So it kind of depends on... You know, and different methods to end up helping with it. So, yeah, if, if I have a patient with a wound, it doesn't make a difference where, it, where it's at. They're always going to be involved. Yeah. Yeah. Always, it's a team. We like right. primary care is a, is right. a team thing, and 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 you know sometimes yeah we direct them to specialists. Sometimes we direct them to a nurse or a right. team, or a PA or or what, and and that's right. that's the beauty of it. Right. A Parkinson woman asks, I'm allergic to thimerosal, um, that mercury thing in vaccinations. Right? Did I pronounce it right? Thimerosal. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, they spelled it it's wrong close. on here. They spelled <laughs> it wrong on here. But I have never reacted to the flu shot. I'm wondering if the doctors recommend for me to get the shingle shot or how to approach this vaccine with my allergy. Probably going to have to talk to your pharmacist, number one, find out what is in the shot that you're going to get, whatever it is. Yeah, whether, is, whether shingles or anything else. I mean, we have on staff a doctor of pharmacy with it, so that's my first question to her. What's, what's in the makeup of the vaccine? Yeah. If there's anything of that component in it. If there isn't, it's not a factor. Yeah. Basically, we... We'd find out. We'd find to out. Yep. Yeah. Uh, are there any tests I should be doing to check for clogged arteries? So you know that free screening or or cheap screening yeah. that's at the church or or the yeah. hospital or anything. Do you recommend that to your patients? I do, especially if they have a stronger family history of heart disease to begin with. And it, and, and it makes it tougher to have it as a blanket statement across the board. Yeah. Everybody's individualized as far as who's even at risk. So is their blood pressure a factor? Is their cholesterol a factor? Do they exercise or not exercise with it? Yeah. Um, what is their age? Because you get to a certain point as far as with it, if you're getting you know, into your 60s and for sure into your 70s, they're, they're for uh, the cardiac one, they are not helpful anymore. Now now we're gonna get confused as far right. as with the, the stroke one starts picking up at that point yeah. as far as actual benefit with it. But they definitely have a place. They're not the sole answer. They are just another tool to end up helping what your risk may end up being. Yeah. There's some studies out there that say, for example, a person with heart disease, you don't need that. I mean, you're beyond that one. And if you have absolutely no family history and you're 26 years of age, the chance you have it is like zilch almost. You don't need that. It's for that in-between person that you don't know whether to refer on or not or should they be on a cholesterol oil medication or not. It's those are the person that is really probably most beneficial. You know, unfortunately, sometimes it can say something was wrong when nothing's actually wrong. Right. You know, when they take the general population and have them all do the test, right. some of them it messes up and or or we decide we better do surgery on this person for this right. problem that they never had a problem before right. and now we've caused a problem. Right. So. Find out from the history what their all risk factors are included with it to yeah. decide whether or not it could potentially be a benefit for that patient. So maybe go talk to your doctor and ask what they think given your yeah. medical right. history and your exactly information. How do you get rid of warts on your feet that have been present for years? I have been shaving them off when I can. If I had that sole <laughs> answer, <laughs> it, it is a very, very tough problem. Um, all kinds of um, home remedies, over-the-counter things, uh, freeze them, burn them off, 
Um, and they're worth a try, aren't they? They're worth a try because you can at least have improvement with it. Now, some of it, as far as with it too, is if it's not bothering you, leave it alone. Eventually, it is a virus. It will go away. You're trying to get rid of it before it would spread, or if it's already big enough to cause pain or symptoms, then you're trying to be more aggressive to get rid of it. But there is no simple answer. With Sometimes it. those treatments, you know, I, I think help gain the body's attention to it to say, yeah. oh yeah, we need to take we, care of this. Yeah, if we get your body to recognize it as abnormal, I had one that we treated with some cantharidin, which is blister beetle juice. Hers was gone in like seven to ten days, and I said, you got to be kidding. She happened to be in, and looked at her foot. It's gone. So if you can get it recognized and and flag it, the body will kill it. We're going to try to go through a bunch of questions now. Okay. Rapid fire. <laughs> Thank you for all the questions. Oh, now it just scrolled way down. Here we go. Numbness in my hands when I wake up at night. What could be the cause? Neck probably, or you're holding your arms. There's a lot of nerves up there in the arms. So talk to your doc, get the history, right. number one. What part of the hand? Yeah. This part or the fourth and fifth, it truly makes a difference as far as where the source is coming from. So have to pinpoint what part of the hand. That might be the wrist, carpal tunnel, might uh -huh. be the elbow, right. ulnar neuropathy. You know, you might want to sleep with a splint that keeps it straight. How do you get rid of wart? Uh, no, that one we did. A man who has a change in bowel movements and is becoming hard to go to the bathroom. He hasn't changed his bowel movements and takes a softener. He takes metamucil fiber yet it's still so hard. He's not due for a colonoscopy for another year. What do you suggest he does? I told my dad to start taking those fiber gummies. Did the trick. Fiber, right? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. water, yeah. fiber, right. fruits, vegetables, exercise. Right, what medicines is he on? Is that having a factor as far as with it? Um, when I hear, okay, I'm not due for a colonoscopy for a year, okay, I don't care. Yes. I mean, part of it is you, you have to eliminate other things as far as with it, history, are they anemic, blood count down. If they are, they're getting another colonoscopy as far as with it, because that can otherwise be a red flag for something more significant too. So you can't forget about that either. And the number one drug that people forget about, water. Yeah. If you don't get enough water, nothing yeah. is going to work. Yeah. That's the whole point of the bowels, to reabsorb the water it if you need it. it. Very good job at it. A male who will be 63 years old in three weeks and is extra, extra tall, almost six foot eight. He has been skinny his whole life, not on any medications, wondering how he can gain weight. Maybe he shouldn't, doesn't need to worry about his weight. Well, I, that would be yeah. my first question is, what is it you, you want to gain weight for? Right. Do you have a reason? Yeah. I mean, if, if it's been this way his whole life, what's, what's different now? Are you losing weight? What is your BMI? What's your height versus your weight? Yeah. If you're okay and I just feel like I need to, if you want to bulk up on muscles, go get some tone, that's okay. But why, I agree, why are you gaining? Here in South Dakota, we have a program that is designed to train and encourage new doctors to serve in rural areas. So the Sioux Falls Family Medicine Residency uh, trains physicians in the specialty of family medicine. The uh, medical education system works uh, af by after you graduate from medical school, you enter what is, is essentially an apprenticeship. It's called a residency. We have a uh, new rural residency program that has started under the sponsorship of the Center for Family Medicine. Um, we have data that shows that the majority of family physicians practice within 100 miles of where they train. Previously, there was a residency in uh, Rapid City and in Sioux Falls. If you draw a 100-mile radius around those two cities, there's a large swath of the state that doesn't fall under that shadow. In an effort to try and improve our workforce of, of primary care physicians in South Dakota, uh, we've uh, started a new uh, residency program that will be based in Pierre. So the resident physicians will spend their first year training in Sioux Falls, and then their second and third year training in Pier, getting used to uh, what a rural practice is like and hopefully staying within that 100 mile radius. So I'm originally from the area, so I had some interest in coming back to the area, but what really drew me here was the quality of the program, the quality of the residents, kind of the culture. Uh, when I interviewed here, it gave a very family atmosphere, a positive learning experience. Um, and obviously, Avera and Sanford are both outstanding facilities to uh, work and train at, and the ability to work at both of them 
um, provided a unique perspective to uh, get a little different experiences in multiple systems. It's important for a healthcare system to have a solid basis of primary care physicians. Uh, there's a lot of data that shows that the cost of health care goes down, the quality of health care goes up, and the mortality rate uh, goes down in direct relationship to the number of primary care physicians that are in the health system. One of the reasons why having a family physician is so important is because if you can have one doctor keep track of all your medical conditions, especially as we age and you know tend to have more issues that need coordination, the family doctor can really be the person who makes sure that all the issues are addressed in a timely fashion, make sure that things that are need to be addressed acutely are and can refer you to specialists if need be and then um, make sure that some of your other chronic conditions aren't forgotten or swept under the rug because of this p acute problem that's going on today right now. Okay, feels good. Different uh, parts of the country are getting closer and closer together but a lot of uh, individuals, older populations in small town really don't like coming to big cities so Having a provider who can communicate all aspects of their care without the need of a specialist um, really can help coordinate everything and make that patient feel at ease. All right, we've got a bunch more questions. We'll keep moving here. My husband was recently diagnosed with sleep apnea. He is on CPAP with a mask set at 14. He found that he was filled up with air in the abdomen and mouth. They dropped the pressure down to 12 and tried a nose piece and his abdomen and mouth still filled with air. What should be the next step for him? It's not doing any good because he's not using it at this time. And, and this is speaking from someone who has sleep apnea. Okay, when I first started with the same issue, you're going to get air. It's forcing it in. Okay, so the majority of the times it is not the pressure setting that it is, it's the mask. Mm. So I have went back at least five if not six different times, different mask. You have to keep working on a different mask to find the one that's going to be right for him. And you keep going back because like I said it's forcing air in you so you're going to get air. What do you know about CBD oil? Some refer to it as the wonder drug. Number one, it's illegal. That's, that's the number one. It's uh, cannabis oil is what it is. And so it's related to the marijuana group. Uh, there's a lot of people using it. I hear people using it for anxiety, depression, uh, autism. There's a lot of, of information out there. But in the state of South Dakota, it's illegal to use. It, you know, it, I think it can be helpful, but we got to study it and, and learn right. more. I don't know enough about it to say one way or the other yeah. if it's going to be of any yeah. benefit. Can you uh, tell me if there's an Alzheimer's support group in Brookings and where? I do know I keep it written down in my desk, but I don't remember all And offhand. I know there is in Watertown, too. Yep. Um, so I, I think that'd be something to call into your doctor and ask for, yeah. and, and I'm sure we could give you the information. I just don't remember offhand when and where they meet. My back ached in July and was diagnosed with MFFA. Does it reoccur? Anything to prevent it or treatment? MFFA. I don't know. What it is. I don't know what I, it is. I'm not sure I can answer that one either. Sorry. I don't know that abbreviation at least. Um, you know, as far as back pain in general, what would you recommend? Look for the red flags. I mean, if they come in and talk to us about, get the history. What's going on? What makes it better? What makes it worse? What were you doing when it happened? You know, I fell down and when it happens, well, then you have a chance that maybe you have a vertebral compression fracture. But if it's, I'm just doing this and I stepped out of the car, um, most of the time, most people don't have a surgery. That's the first thing they talk about. I don't want to have surgery. Well, that's the last thing we want to give you. And so do a lot of medications such as plain Tylenol or non-steroidals or a muscle relaxant, physical therapy. Physical therapy for sure, exercise yep. activity. Yeah. That's still going to be primary as far as benefit. Yeah. Yeah. At 81 years old, should people still have a colonoscopy? What if they only had one little node or polyp, I suppose, that was okay about five years ago? Well, you know, some might say after 80 to not have them anymore, but I have some, seen some studies that if you're absolutely healthy 
that maybe there's some benefit to pushing it 81, 82, 83, depending. What other health issues exactly. do they have going on? Is it a risk to have it? Because otherwise, I'm not going to recommend to have somebody just to have it look to look, not at that age. Um, we're not going to put them through anything that they really don't necessarily need. So you've, there are other ways to follow with it without having to go through the procedure. Because there is increased risk of perforation That's or right. complications. It's and different if they start dropping on their blood count or they're having blood in the stool. or That's a different story. Yeah. Okay, but to look, to look, no. Yeah. Usually they cut off at 75 and the, the rule of thumb is if you have less than 10 years, no. Right. I'm currently taking amlodipine and carvedilol for blood pressure. I have developed areas of brown spots on my feet and ankles. I suspect it's the amlodipine. Is there anything that can be done to get rid of the pigmentation? Amlodipine was always at least top of the list for having edema or swelling. Right. I guess I'm not aware of the pigmentation change if that, that. that's in relationship to that drug. But maybe, you know, they have high blood pressure, maybe they have some peripheral vascular disease causing some hemosiderin staining that, that the, the pigment on the legs that yeah. your you can see. So, you know, maybe the, the, they could benefit from compression stockings or it depends on the situation. It, especially if they're having any swelling with it, that may yeah. be the underlying cause of the whole thing to begin with. Yeah. My knees have arthritis and at some point I may need a replacement. Right now they are doing okay, but my shoulder has started to bother me. My orthopedic says it's wearing out again. I have started on an anti-inflammatory and it has helped. I am 63 and have always been active and healthy. Will exercise help me? If you're talking the osteoarthritis in the knees, the shoulder, or if it's right. the knees, the latest stuff out there, the latest information says physical therapy is the number one thing you can do for osteoarthritis. Uh, I thought it'd be meds and injections stuff, but when you really look at the studies, the physical therapy program is number one to help these people stay active. Tylenol's not gonna help you as long as you don't overdose. Motrin helps, but this is even put ahead of Motrin and Aleve. And that, that might not mean, mean go out and start running. No, no but no. there are other different types of activity and, and we were made to move. Yeah. Okay, so the less we do, the worse some of this gets as far as with it. And if we haven't figured out here yet to ready, exercise is going to be yeah. a main theme right. as we're going on for treatment of a lot of things as far as with it. But they might want to go see a physical therapist to get some help with right. learning what do would it, be do good it the for them correct to way. use. Yeah. Otherwise they might injure themselves too. Hay fever this year. Wake up year round with a runny nose. Could acid reflux cause a runny nose? How do I tell if the runny nose is allergies or acid reflux or something else? You start with your history first. Yeah. That would be number one. Can a runny nose be caused by GERD or gastroesophageal reflux? Absolutely it can. Uh, the biggest one I've seen with GERD is the cough, the hidden cough. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, no, I don't have any heartburn and I don't have this chest pain or anything. And you scope and you see all the irritations like, well, it is your GERD. So yeah, it can. And this year was kind of a different year. We saw it starting around August 1st with the ragweed. And if you want to do something simple, why don't you try some Flonase or Zyrtec? Right. You can always yeah, have a trial of something because yep. uh, they're relatively benign as far as having anything of an issue and you can help decide one way or the other which one may be the leading force with it. Yeah. You know, I'd look at side effects from medications or other reasons, right. but those would be the top right. things to consider. Um, I've even had people that solve the problem by changing their pillow. Maybe their pillow was too old or their bed or something because mm -hmm. every time they went on vacation, it was fine. What are the pros and cons of vitamins and supplements? What are good ones to take or not to take? Well, my recommendation to my patients is if you truly want to take one, one multivitamin a day. Not all of them separate or handful with them. You know, all patients come in one in particular. Absolutely did not want to take anything of any medications, but takes 23 supplement pills every day. For what? Hmm. You, the majority of us, don't even have to come close to needing anything with it. If, if we think we're lacking a little bit in our diet, like I said, one multivitamin a day is enough. You know, unfortunately, the supplement industry just isn't regulated, and so sometimes it can vary from bottle to bottle and what's actually in there. So you got to really be careful. It can be very expensive, too. Yeah. Watch the calcium and the vitamin D. Those are the two that you really probably need to get the most of that you're not getting. I am, cons but it's better to have the calcium from your diet than, than a pill. Yep, correct. 
I am concerned if my heart rate, 96 beats per minute, is too high. I am in my 70s and I weigh 99 pounds with a blood pressure of 116 over 73. I am overall healthy and haven't been to a doctor in years. 96 beats per minute. Too no, high? Normal heart rate is 60 to 100. I'd leave it at that. Blood pressure is good. No symptoms of anything else with it. Don't, don't try to fix something that's not broke. But if he hasn't been to his doctor years, it might not be a bad idea in, to come in. In general, he should, he sometimes should have Sometimes we things find like something <laughs> that, that we didn't right. know there was a But was based a on his heart rate alone, right. no. But in general, for everything else, yes, we all need periodic checkups. Yeah, maybe we'll hear a murmur or something yeah. is going on. Yeah. So. You might want to ask him, are you drinking enough water? Because if you're not filling the tank, your heart's beating faster trying to compensate to keep that blood pressure up. Yeah. might be a simple. Or maybe he does have atrial fibrillation and irregular heart mm -hmm. rate, and it's on the higher end, just not way out of control. Mm -hmm. And so that visit with their doctor might, might detect that. I've had that happen. You yeah. know, they, I've been fine. I don't need to come in. Well, you know, it would be nice if you came in to, ref, you know, you're on your blood pressure medication. We want to make sure everything's okay. And sure enough, they had, they had an irregular heart rhythm. You never know sometimes. What causes cramps in the foot, ankle during the night? What treatments are there? Another million dollar question. Yeah. <laughs> Very common. Um, making sure you're gonna stay hydrated is gonna be number one. Um, again, what medicines are they on? Are they on anything that could potentially lower their potassium? That would be a high reason for having cramps. Um, doing some stretching before bed, loosening up, anything else as far as with it. But, um, and like I said, de then depending on anything of that, is gonna be individual based on what that patient may or may not be on or taking. Hot baths seems to work for some people. Just to kind of relax those before you go to bed. I have some that get up during the night with a cramp, get in some hot water and then they're able to go back to rest. Yeah, you know, I'd say some have found magnesium helpful or potassium or stress. Or some other like home said. remedy yeah. and it works and I go, if it works, yeah. use it. Yeah. Uh, pickle juice water yeah. or something like that. That's what the football <laughs> players <Yeah>. are. <laughs> Uh, does tachycardia, so a heart, high heart rate, have a relation to sleep apnea? If you're, if you have sleep apnea, there's things that you got there. If you're a male, high blood pressure, high blood pressure in your lungs called pulmonary hypertension, um, erectile dysfunction, you're going to die an early death, statistically, and you're chronically tired. So if you're having some of these factors to have a higher, your body's having to work harder. It's like holding your breath and having to try and work harder so you might have some tachycardia but we would mentioned before in the atrial fib and stuff if your heart's not getting enough oxygen it lets you know it just says you know I don't like this mm -hmm. so I'm gonna beat irregular mm -hmm. are there any new meds or treatments for macular degeneration you're really good at that dance uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea on that one I, I'm relying on our ophthalmologist for that. Um, for at least in general from what I, I hear, okay, maybe some of the um, lutein for helping in prevention, but once you have it, okay, there's not a whole lot more that is gonna otherwise be done as a continued progression of things as far as with it. Do you have many patients on Occuvite? Yes. For that, because of the lutein, and, yeah. yeah. I had influenza A this past winter, so could I get it again or am I immune? I guess we already talked about yes. that, how you could get it again. How can I boost my immunity during flu season? Do natural essential oils help? Never seen any studies on that. Get enough sleep, push the fluids. Right. Don't touch your eyes. Number one which way to catch a cold is to rub your eyes. Um, if you're around a lot of people shaking hands, don't don't shake hands in church and stuff. Yeah, good hand washing. Yeah. But at least as far as to say, is it going to help? No idea. Is it going to hurt? Same thing. No idea as far as with it. These other things are going to be, to me, much more effective yeah. as Maybe far as prevention. Cough into your yeah. arm instead of your hand. And then right. And how many do you see in the clinic? I mean, do you wear a mask during the influenza season? If it's really bad, I will. But otherwise, mm -hmm. we're exposed to it every day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Facebook question, if I take some meds in the morning, but then have several episodes of vomiting during the, probably later, should the meds be taken? Well, I guess they're wondering if they're having a side effect from the medication, and I guess that's all gonna be situation specific. Right. What is it they're taking? 
and, and how long afterwards before that ends up occurring. Yeah, that, that one needs a little bit more digging into. And talking with their doctor and say, well, which ones, let's, you know, if you don't want to stop all of them at once, how do you know which one was right. helpful to stop? So, right. Yeah. A woman from Sioux Falls has MAC lung disease treated with antibiotics. One doctor says, I need treatment or will die in three months. Another said, don't need treatment. What's real? MAC lung disease. I don't need that. Yeah. Off the top of my head, no. Treated with antibiotics. Well, you know, in general, if, it, if they feel like it's an infection and uh, it sounds like they're telling them that you know the antibiotics will help keep them from dying. So I, apparently there must be some sort of infection involved, and uh, I'd, I'd probably go with the recommendation of your doctor if if there's a fix like antibiotics. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, in the gen in 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 general, I, 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 I'm curious how they came up with the dye in three months and yeah, everything. I but talk yeah. to your family doc. Yeah. Your internal medicine doc, <laughs> yeah. who at least would have access to all of those other things yep. and know what where they were coming right. from to begin they, with. Right. What should I do to improve the health of my eyes? Where e eat more carrots? What? <laughs> you can protect your eyes. I mean, number one, if you're out there, uh, the farmers on the farm wire and stuff that they're working. Protect your eyes, number one. Number two is if you're out there in the sun, the ranchers, farmers, game wardens, all these people, sports people, boaters, you gotta be protected against the sun's rays because that's some of the worst damage that can develop. And get your eyes checked. Uh, Root, routine checks, just oh yeah. like everything else in relation to our health. I mean, the sooner you can detect anything, a potential problem of anything else with it, then the longer it would take for it to otherwise progress. You may want the sunglasses with UV protection. UV yes. protection, yeah. yeah. My, okay. neighbor, my neighbor thinks vaccinations can cause autism. Why are there so many misconceptions about this? The fast answer. <laughs> <laughs> Show me the studies. Yeah, yeah. Show, yeah. yeah. It, it, it has been touted as that for a long time and still has not been proven. There was a disproved study that came yes. out years ago that kind of snowballed it and then a couple... Uh, You're talking about uh, that autism study? Yeah, yeah. It was tainted. I mean, yeah. it wasn't a good study to begin with. Uh, they did the one study over in Japan where they stopped the immunizations. The autism rate actually went down when they went and started the immunizations back up again. Yeah. So it was actually higher without it. Yeah, thank you. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. A continuity of care results in A, more satisfied patients, B, patients following through with their doctor's recommendations, C, lower hospitalization rates, D, decreased use of the emergency room, or E, all of the above? And the answer is E, all of the above. It was Erwin Raymond who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Erwin, for participating, and a book will be in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. Welcome to your Prairie Doc Library at www.prairiedoc.org. Wherever you live or travel, you and your family can enjoy free and easy access 24 hours a day. Search for a specific topic, browse through the television shows, radio programs, and blog page. You, your family, and friends around the world can learn from physicians and other health professionals answering questions on a variety of medical topics. Visit your Prairie Doc Library Library today at www.prairiedoc.org. Wind Cave National Park is a complex maze of narrow passageways and chambers located underground, under the prairie, just on the edge of the Black Hills of South Dakota. My family and I took a tour of the cave this summer. It is astonishing how big and complex it is. Established as the sixth national park in 1903, it is one of the largest and most complex caves in the world. It is over 140 miles long, but is a complex maze compacted into one square mile below the earth. They are still exploring and finding more of it. One of the early explorers of the cave, Alvin McDonald, was 16 years old when he was exploring the cave 
for miles at a time by candlelight. He knew the cave so well, he guided tour groups through it. As the story goes, one time he left a group alone for a bit as he explored a new passageway. He made his way back to the surface and back home, only to realize later that night that he forgot his group. Thankfully, he came back for them. I couldn't imagine being lost in that large, complex cave without a guide. Much like the complex maze of Wind Cave, our healthcare system is also an expanding complex maze of diseases, tests, hospitals, specialists, and medications. I couldn't imagine someone trying to navigate the healthcare system without a trusted primary care provider to help guide them. People who turn to one physician, nurse practitioner, PA, medical home, or clinic for the majority of their medical care who have continuity of care are healthier. Studies have found that if you have one person to help guide you, you are less likely to go to the emergency room, less likely to need to be in the hospital, more likely to follow the advice of your primary care provider, and are happier, healthier, and more satisfied overall. Your personal physician is like your tour guide in the cave, guiding you along the way and helping you avoid those dead ends. Your primary care provider can be your first stop for care, catching problems early on and keeping you on track for lifelong good health. A big thank you to our guests, Dr. Aaron Shives and Dr. Dan Riefenberger, for volunteering to come to our studio in Yeager Hall on the campus of South Dakota State University. The experience they brought was key to tonight's program. Remember, we are getting into the annual flu season. It really isn't too early to get your flu shot. It is important not just for you, but to help protect those around you. Remember that uh, you can go to our Facebook page and we're going to cover a few more of the questions that we didn't get to. So go to Prairie Doc on Facebook and we'll answer a few more questions for you. That does it for tonight, but from all of us here on On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Interfere with work, play, and relationships headaches and cutting edge therapies to help cure them. Next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. I'm here to tell you about a wonderful new treasure that's going to be available to you right now online. It's a book called Life's Final Season, written by Dr. Rick Holm, who is quite a remarkable man. This book, I've, I've had the privilege of looking at it ahead of time. What a treasure. And what I kept thinking of when I read this book was, do you remember that wonderful soup your mother used to make with a rich, thick broth? And she would put vegetables left over from dinner, and she'd put meat, she put a little bit of everything in that stew. And it, it fed your body, but it fed your soul. This book is like your mother's stew. There's something in it, everything you want to know about aging, helping you prepare to, to die. This is a wonderful, nurturing, nourishing book. Please read it. You won't be sorry. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support on-call television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medical Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System. Ophthalmology Limited. American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians. Avera Heart Hospital. 
Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Cobank, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Brown Clinic, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Third District Medical Society, Seventh District Medical Society, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, and Swiftel Communications. Thank you.